Hi guys. This is Steve. Welcome back to Insectamundi. Still out here in uh, Saitama province. Or, sorry, Saitama prefecture, Japan. Don't know if you can see all of these dragonflies flying around in this field. A little windy out as well. See if I can get one of them. Dragonflies are pretty difficult to capture, uh, mostly because they're zigzagging around so much uh, and their visual acuity is really quite remarkable since they are aerial predators uh, sort of similar to their juvenile form which is aquatic it's aquatic but uh, it's also predatory uh, you can see or if you've ever watched dragonflies fly about and damselflies do this to some degree as well that they will patrol uh, a territory. And this is essentially for mating purposes. And similar to actually various types of bees as well, and wasps, if something, some foreign insect or foreign animal, usually a foreign insect though, if it's too large they normally don't chase after it, but if it's a foreign insect that happens to go in its territory they'll run after it, or fly after it, <laughs> obviously not run. So let's see if we can capture one of these. All right, guys, I was able to capture one. So let's be careful. Reach into here. careful not to uh, destroy its wings. Look at that. These are very adept aerial predators. The in the order Odonata, particularly the dragonflies. You see the legs are just covered with, they're covered with uh, long seedy. There we go. And that's to aid in capturing prey items. And so they'll grab them with their legs and just start chewing, start devouring them. You can see those large compound eyes that it has, just thousands, made of thousands of little facets called omatidia. And each omatidia has its own lens, which focuses light, and pigment receptors inside. This particular one is in the family Libellulidae pretty difficult to uh, say quickly. Um, sometimes the compound eyes of dragonflies can be sort of divided in half with the omatidia on the upper 
half uh, a different size than the ones on the lower half. And this is essentially to aid in prey capture. Okay, so the visual acuity of the different size omatidia um, is different. Okay. And this occurs in other insects as well. Uh, not necessarily divided eyes like that, but there'll be different sized omatidia positioned in various parts of the eyes. They might be on top or on the sides or even on the lower part of the eyes. Uh, and they can be, have different photoreceptors inside as well. So not all of the omatidia within a compound eye necessarily will pick up all the same type of light. And you see, dragonflies are just really beautiful. I mean, their wings are just, you see all the veins in them. This sort of pattern is called an archidiction. This dense patterning of veins. And they're just extremely agile flyers, if you've ever seen them. Odinates these days, well, they can get fairly large in size. But essentially, before the Permian, you had a whole entire super order that were these giant sort of dragonfly looking insects and they were in the group Paleodictyopterida. Now these resembled dragonflies uh, but they weren't necessarily they weren't really related to them. Uh, many of them had beak-like mouth parts and the aquatics, the, well, the immature stages of them, we're not really sure what they did, whether they were aquatic or not. And the various groups of these Paleodictyopteridans, unfortunately, they went extinct uh, at the mass extinction in the Permian, at the end of the Permian. So this entire superorder went extinct at the end of the Permian. And for a while, they were the only aerial predators. These, and many of them were pretty massive in size. The largest ones being up to 70 centimeters in wingspan. So you're getting close to a meter wingspan size. And what's left, really, of the relatives of that group are today's dragonflies and damselflies, the Odonata. They're really spectacular organisms. Also, if you, if you ever look at a, a dragonfly close up, sometimes you can see the abdomen pumping. It's sort of becomes flat and it expands a little bit. You can see it slightly here. You see the abdomen moving a little bit. Okay, so what it's doing is it's actively breathing, essentially. It's also pushing blood and hemolymph to help it circulate within the body. You can see it a little better ventrally, actually. See that abdomen? It's expanding and contracting. Yeah, that's because inside it's filled with these tubes called trachea, as well as air sacs. Their entire body is just filled with air sacs. And so this pumping is helping squeeze, helping force through air to different parts of the body. And this helps regulate the temperature, okay? As well as gives them, it pushes gases throughout the body. 
the oxygen and CO2 after they breathe. Since they are such active flyers, they need this type of, of, of uh, body ventilation. Really impressive. And of course, odonates are not the only ones that do that. Uh, you'll, as we'll see maybe later, all sorts of insects will pump different parts of their body, usually the abdomen, but other parts as well, maybe in the thorax, to help ventilate their body, to push uh, blood and to push air through. Very nice. Let's let this one go. And off it goes. I'll need to patrol its same territory. Here's a nice butterfly. This looks like another a nymphalid, family nymphalidae. Oh, oh cicada just came by. Shoot, guys, I just missed a cicada. That's what happens when you're out collecting. Sometimes things just sort of drop on you or fly into you. Uh, or if you're using a particular technique like beading, which is taking a, essentially it's sort of like a sheet. And you can take a stick, essentially, and sort of tap or beat the branches. And sometimes you get some fascinating things that fall out of the foliage. Uh, particularly at night, um, say you're beating in the tropics uh, at night and you might get some pretty large spiders uh, that you beat out of the bush. <laughs> so you never know what will come out. Here's something interesting, sort of that we've seen before but in a different fashion. You see this white, all these white things. And this is not a disease or a fungus on this tree, but they're scale insects. And scale insects are really quite diverse. Uh, there's several families of scale insects. And a lot of them are sort of neotenic. They're kind of larva-like and they have reduced bodies. So they don't really resemble a lot of other insects. You know, they don't, um, particularly the females. The males often will look like a sort of a normal insect. They'll have wings, legs, you know, all the proper appendages. But the females, once they find once the larva finds a good spot to feed, as she, as she molts, uh, she becomes more kind of juvenile in form. It's, might lose legs. Um, the wings are usually lost. Uh, even the eyes can be reduced and lost. So the, the various appendages get reduced. And so they'll just sit here in this sort of docile state and feed. And you'll see that's what they're doing. So underneath this white stuff, which is wax that they produce, really copious amounts of wax, underneath all that wax is their body. Okay. And oftentimes scale insects will um, kind of like the bagworm moths, where the male flies by and uh, inseminates the female. This happens in scale insects, so the males will fly by, copulate, and eventually the female then will just sort of secrete her eggs into this waxy mass and they'll hatch there. And some scale insects really produce a lot of wax where it just sort of comes off in these big fluffy cushions. 
And of course, many scale insects are serious pests in agriculture, and that's why a lot of people study them. You'll see, also, it's not just scale insects here. There's a lot of ants. And of course, these ants are tending to the scale insects. They're both defending them, as well as eating the honeydew that's produced by them. The sweet, watery excrement produced by the scale insects. Over here, you might be able to see a little more of the actual body of the scale insects, that kind of pinkish color. These are pr fairly small in size. Uh, you see my finger here. Fairly small in size. Let's see if we can't peel back one of these. So I just sort of peeled back the wax. You can see that pink body that's there. Some scales don't produce just those soft, fluffy waxes. They might produce uh, harder types of wax. Um, if you've ever heard of shellac, uh, a sh shellac is a, a sort of hard type of wax that was produced by a certain type of scale insect. And you can get different types of these hard waxes produced by them. So they'll, they'll secrete them again from all of these different glands, these epidermal glands on their, their dorsal surface. And this protects them, protects them from predators and parasitoids. It's pretty interesting to see, you know, these tiny societies living within broader ecosystems, you know, because humans, we act at a fairly large scale, right? Uh, our world is, is fairly big. It's, it's a big scale. But if you look closely, there's all types of sort of different sized ecosystem worlds hiding within our own okay and these are you know these are different insect societies um, the ants and the scale insects or ants and hemipterans are one of them uh, others are sort of the social societies themselves which ants are so ants are a a type of social insect um, social meaning they have a reproductive division of labor, so they have a queen, um, and then they have workers. The workers are actually female, um, and workers and other social insects, including things like you know, wasps and bees, they're females, uh, but their reproductive capacity is suppressed. Um, and with ants, there's not just a reproductive, there's, there's not just the queen and the workers, but there's also another caste, typically, of soldiers, okay? So you have these interesting miniature societies with our, within our own, right? You just have to know where to look. You guys hear those high-pitched noises? It's probably one of my favorite 
parts about Japan, and maybe iconic, um, are the sounds of the cicadas in the summer, particularly this high, sh high shrilled pitched one. There's some really close by. Let's see if we can find them. guys it was right right next to us look at that oh. see he was giving us a chorus there these cicadas this particular species tends to sing in the evening. Uh, I say tends to because you can, you can hear it at other times uh, during the day. But in some parts, they seem to really only sing in the evening. Let's see if we can try to capture one, get a closer look. All right, guys. Still singing in the net. I was able to capture this one. Oh, we can't coax it out of the net here. making some noise. I'm not hurting it. I'm holding it very very lightly. This is a vocal species, isn't it? Now remember, they're producing this sound with their timbre. You can sort of see these a little bit below where my, where my thumbs are. There's this two large sort of circular plates and under that is the timbre okay and just above that then are the hearing organs the tympana look at that you also notice on the ventral surface let's see if i can zoom in a little Notice on the ventral surface, you see that long straw kind of in the middle of the body. That's, that's those are its mouth parts. So cicadas can be somewhat destructive in terms of their feeding. Uh, they, although they, they feed on trees, so uh, they're not a problem with uh, sort of smaller shrubby crops. Um, but they do cause a lot of damage, actually, when they're laying their eggs. So the female will use its ovipositor to saw a hole into the tree to deposit the egg. So it'll do that into uh, you know, a small branch on a tree and lay its egg. And, and that branch then usually dies because it it's, uh, causes quite a bit of damage. To that particular branch or that twig on the tree uh, but they're not very big agricultural pests in terms of uh, you know scale insects or, or other types of uh, beetles or moths very interesting right these are really pretty cicadas and their sounds certainly are very pretty as well. So let's release this one to join the chorus again.
here's the thing I should mention is that you know these are annual cicadas. These species come out uh, every year. Uh, but there are species that come out maybe every several years. Or there's you know, 13, 15, 17 year cicadas. Um, and these are some of the longest lived insect taxa. It's quite a long time for insects. There are some uh, some other insects, like some large beetle species, or some aquatic taxa uh, that also have many year lifespans. But the cicadas um, are perhaps the longest, particularly the 17 year. And it's really quite amazing to think, you know, that these things will stay in the ground for that long, uh, essentially sort of in a quiescent or dormant stage. And then they emerge just pretty much uh, all at the same time. Now, some might emerge a year early and some maybe a year late, but most of them will emerge on time. Pretty fascinating, cicadas. Maybe go to another spot. I think I hear another spot where the the melody is playing a little louder. Oh, although this isn't bad. I think that's the one we just released. found another species of cicada that we, uh, usually occurs much higher in the tree, so they're harder to reach. Um, I say sort of because this one is kind of partially eaten. It's not alive. Uh, see. But you see how beautiful the wings are on these. They're a really pretty pattern. Quite different from other species. And they're fairly large size. Yeah. Another kind of fascinating thing here. There's all these large land snails. Not quite certain if these are native or invasive. Native, perhaps. We walk down this little trail through the woods, all this bamboo lining it. You can really get a sense of what the evening insect sounds are like. Just filled with crickets, grillidae, and katydids, tetagoniidae, obviously cicadas multiple species of cicadas. 
And those are the family cicada day. Not sure if you can see this here. There's a fly hanging from this leaf here. That is a crane fly in the family Tepulidae. And a lot of people mistake them for just big mosquitoes. Uh, it says they, they resemble mosquitoes in a way. Uh, but they're not. And they, they won't bite. Tepulids just like to kind of hang around. guys here we can hear uh, that larger sort of more colorful species of cicada you hear it it's a it's a lower pitched sort of a more monotonous tone and it's more of a continuous tone and we were lucky that one of them was within reach of my telescopic pole here. There it is. Let's get it out of the net. So this is that other species. See, it's a little less vocal uh, than that high-pitched shrilling one, uh, but certainly very pretty. And you'll see the it's it's uh, proboscis there. Got a very long proboscis. And you can see on the adults, they still have um, somewhat of a remnant of what you call fossorial um, legs. So the forelegs are somewhat fossorial because the, uh, the immature stages in particular, if you look at the the cuticle, the shed cuticle of, of one of the immature stages that you, you'll usually find uh, stuck to the side of a tree uh, for the adults to emerge. You'll see that the four legs of those immature stages are really robust and have large spines on them and such. So those are fossorial and it's so they can climb uh, up vegetation but also, so they can, uh, <laughs> you'll see this, this giant hornet approached me because it was thinking that it might be able to steal this cicada perhaps. Um, so the immature stages have these fossorial limbs so they can burrow out of the ground right, when they're ready to emerge as adults. And you can still see that a little bit on the adults. The adult forelegs are still uh, somewhat robust. And you'll see the front of the cicada kind of looks like a, a mask in a way between the two compound eyes. And that's where the Siberium is. And the Siberium is part of the, it's essentially a region in the pharynx of the mouth. And a lot of muscles are in this region, in this Siberium. And that's to pump up fluid for when the cicada is feeding on the, on the plant. Okay, it requires a lot of 
uh, muscular contraction to draw up that liquid from the plant, the, the phloem. Okay. Very pretty cicada. Just put this back here. See how well they blend in with the trees. I just walking further along, bumped into these small moths, sort of in this, this lower foliage here. And those are the adults of inchworms. So they're in the family Geometridae. And like I mentioned, the immature stages, the, the larvae or the caterpillars, are inchworms. And if you've ever seen inchworms move, uh, they're called that because they look, they sort of inch along. They look like they're measuring uh, the substrate as they move. And the adult geometrids, uh, they're sort of these flimsy, uh, skinny-bodied looking moths. Um, but you usually find them sort of in lower brush. They're usually, they're all hiding during the day, of course. Um, and then they come out at night. And you can really hear all of the insect sounds here. Those are cicadas, a lot of singing tetagoneids, katydids. And here, what we've seen before, it's a scorpion fly. Order Macoptera, family Panorpidae. Just there, perched on the leaf. And actually, right next to it is a Katie did. Right here. See the long antennae. Oh, there it is. I guess I caught it by surprise. It was relaxing. Here's an interesting uh, orthopter in here. Let's see if you guys can see it. It's mimicry, it's, it's camouflage is actually quite, quite good. There it is. That is in the family Tetrigidae. Not sure what the common name is. I think there might be the pygmy grasshoppers. Uh, I'm not certain. You see, this one's not moving at all. It's trying to stay hidden. 
ekran. I can get it to move. These are not very large. And tetrigids usually have excellent camouflage. Uh, typically you can find them well, in, in various types of habitats, you know, on vegetation, on tree trunks like here, or maybe in more arid um, habitats where they're usually blending in with sand or various rocky outcrops. Alright guys, here, like I mentioned earlier, oh, actually right next to it, I was going to point to this cicada shell, but right next to it is a moth just sitting right there. This looks like it's in the family uh, Megalopigidae. Oh, boy. oh, there it is. Flew under this log here. The Megalopigid. So, what I was originally going to show you was this cicada shell here, or this exuvia, as it's called. You see, like I mentioned, the giant forelimbs here, which are these fossorial uh, types of legs and it's used they're used to uh, dig out of the substrate right and then to crawl up on vegetation um, from which they just hang usually and then to molt they split the back open and the cicada uh, emerges from the dorsal surface and it then just hangs there until the, the cuticle of the the newly uh, synthesized cuticle of the adult hardens because it takes a little bit of time in a process called tanning for this newly secreted cuticle to become harder so that uh, it can then fly. So actually after molting they're quite insects are quite vulnerable uh, for various periods of time until their new, newly synthesized cuticle tans and hardens. The camera's moving a little bit. I don't know if you can see all of these. These are mosquitoes flying around near my feet. Uh, it's quite a lot all seem to be 80s in the genus 80s the tiger mosquitoes and they're quite quite irritating um, but actually also quite beautiful <laughs> if you look at them close up they have this banded pattern of white and black and as I mentioned before that's due to the color on their scales And scales you know, are another marvelous example of convergent evolution in insects uh, because they've evolved numerous times. Uh, and they've evolved numerous times independently of one another. So you have scales, which actually are, they're modified seedy, 
they're modified hairs that are flattened and then can take on various structures. Uh, but scales have evolved in multiple lineages of insects. They've evolved not just in the Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies, but in the Culicidae, the mosquitoes. Uh, they're in various types of beetle families. Weevils uh, have scales on their bodies. If you've ever seen silverfish, uh, they're a very primitive group of insects. Silverfish are covered with scales. That's, um, that's what gives them their silver appearance. Um, other groups of diptera, other groups of flies, have evolved scales, not just mosquitoes. Uh, let's see, what else? There are, there's some a cricket family that has scales. Um, there's just all sorts of different insect groups that have independently evolved scales. It's, it's really impressive. Um, and the forms of the scales in these different groups are all different. Some of them are just, uh, they're pigmented, so they have a pigmented color in which they're usually maybe just a brown color. Um, but a lot of them actually have very um, intricate internal structures. Or they, they can be external structures as well. But these 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 micro or ultra structuring of the cuticle itself, of the individual scales, uh, it can be patterned in such a way to reflect light and to disperse light in various ways, such that you get iridescent colors or different metallic colors. Uh, and I mean, here's the interesting, well, another interesting thing about scales is that scales are secreted by individual cells, okay, individual scale cells. And you can think of, well, a seda or a hair on an insect called a seda is also secreted by an individual cell. And you can kind of think of these cells as an insect as a whole. The individual cells, which are of the epidermis, they secrete cuticle. So a scale cell, for instance, will secrete, after it's formed this kind of large flattened structure, it then secretes the chitin, okay, it secretes the exoskeleton, the cuticle, and then this, this will start to harden. And then as that happens, the scale cell will die. So what's left is this structure of the scale, okay? Much like an insect as a whole, right? An insect secretes a cuticle or an exoskeleton. So yeah, scales are really interesting and intricate structures themselves. And I encourage you, you know, to look up maybe some images of scales you know, on the internet, and you you will see the the amazing ultra structure of scales and how they can reflect light in different ways, scatter light to produce different different colors. Now I'm sort of in this weedy area here, and what I'm seeing are just a lot of scorpion flies. This is a great area for scorpion flies. You see, they're just perching on the leaves. There's one. Oh. I don't know what that other insect was. I think it was a beetle, a scarab beetle. So there's one. Walk a little more. These seem to be a little more easily disturbed, so they might be a little more ready to fly. And there's another one, right there. They're just kind of perching in various places. Here's another one. 
again you see those that bulbous male genitalia that's curved over the, the uh, back there making it resemble a scorpion and they'll actually when you try to grab them they may actually they'll, they'll extend that stinger looking apparatus again which is the genitalia they'll extend it um, and I'm not sure if that's really to, to, to mimic or to make it look as though it's stinging um, but they do have claspers as part of that genital apparatus um, it, it wouldn't hurt but maybe they, they're trying to grab you with these claspers um, but those claspers are usually used to grab uh, the female uh, during mating so, but it wouldn't hurt you at all Here's another interesting insect right here. This is a, in the family Flatidae, I think. Oops. It's another family of uh, Hemiptera. And they are plant feeders. And you can see, obviously, very good jumping abilities. A lot of different Hemiptera, families in Hemiptera are great jumpers. You can think of plant hoppers in the family Membracidae. Um, flatids, obviously, are great jumpers. Uh, cicadelids, plant hoppers. They're all really great jumpers. There's another scorpion fly just sitting. See that behavior of sort of waving its wings, and that looks to be a female. And guys, there's another flathead that's perched here on the tree. They actually have a very fine wing venation and a pretty intricate wing pattern. It's hard to see, you really need a microscope. It's quite pretty. And next to it, actually, uh, is a caterpillar. So sort of the larval stage of a lepidopteran. And I'm not sure what this one could be. It could be in the family Lasiocampidae as well, or maybe it's a nocturid, I'm not certain. Very fuzzy. A lot of Lepidopter and caterpillars, they, they can be fairly bare, um, or they can be covered with lots of cedia on their body. And this is a sort of an anti-predator mechanism, because all of these long cedi, you can see them in the front as well. They, they use them to sense their environment, um, but it's also used to d deter predators or parasitoids by covering themselves with these CD. And in some groups of, of Lepidoptera, these CD can be urticating, so they can be stinging, uh, stinging hairs essentially. And that's because at the base of these CD uh, can be little uh, toxic or, or venom glands and they can release some, some chemical compounds through the, the body of the CETA um, if it is stuck into a predator.
Thought I'd just show some of the beautiful Japanese countryside here. Next to these loud cicadas. Hiding in his hiding in these bushes here. There's a swallowtail butterfly, Papiliana day. Hey guys, this is a nice find. There's this really large, looks like in the family Aishnidae, this dragonfly. And it was flying around me a couple seconds and then it just landed here. And you can see it's got a prey item. Looks like a Katie did that it had caught. You see it just munching away. A pretty large sized Aishnid, and Aishnids are large bodied dragonflies. They're of the larger of the families. See them just munching away. Somewhat surprised it's letting me get this close, but it was probably a little tired of carrying this large meal item in flight. I probably just wanted to perch and start feeding. Maybe it's just very hungry. The Aishnids are also, they're very beautiful dragonflies. You have this really vibrant emerald green on the thorax as well as the the head and the eyes you see the eyes in particular the compound eyes of aishnids are enormous they wrap almost around the entire head and so you can see how their visual acuity is just remarkable Let's see if we can side view here See those mouth parts at work there. It's got a good meal. I went to wing. Very beautiful dragonflies. And of course the immature stages of odonates, they're aquatic and highly predatory as well, particularly the, the dragonflies. And what's interesting about the immature dragonflies is that they have this labial mask. So they have a labium that uh, will project out from the head. It will be kind of covering up the head like this, sort of like an arm. Um, the labium actually being a modified appendage, uh, just like the other mouth parts. So the labium will sort of be, co be covering the, the oral region and the immature. And when there's a prey item, 
it, it shoots out, okay, and then pulls in its prey item. And so these aquatic uh, immature dragonfly stages are really quite impressive. Uh, and this, this happens extremely quickly. it here is making pretty quick strides in finishing its meal. Kind of imagine that they have to eat somewhat quickly because they can be disturbed uh, sometimes by other dragonflies that try to steal their meals or maybe other insects, other predatory insects. A very beautiful dragonfly. Again it's kind of rare that you can get up extremely close to these dragonflies because they're really usually focused on any movement. Here I think it's just so busy eating its meal that uh, it's not really paying attention. Or maybe it's, it just likes being videotaped. Very photogenic individual. It's just about done there. Finishing the leg. I need to give you a size comparison. Let's see how close I can get here. My finger. Yeah. That's a pretty large individual. All right, so I think that's probably a good way to wrap things up. Sort of reach the edge of the woods here. In this nice uh, countryside area. And you can see the beautiful view, the sun setting, and the mountains in the background. We're pretty close to the western mountain range here. western side of the Kanto region. And I'll perhaps try to do a night collecting uh, video at some point because a lot of different insects will emerge at night. Um, particularly if you set up a, a light sheet that attracts in, in areas like this, you just get hundreds and hundreds of, of all sorts of, of taxa. And you know, for, for those of you who are not you know, in a rural region, or maybe you're in the middle of a city, you can still find lots of insects in those habitats as well. You just have to look. Now, it's not to say that insects are diverse in urban habitats, they're not. Um, you know, you really want natural habitats, uh, wild habitats. That's where the diversity is highest. Uh, but you can find insects almost anywhere, really. That's the great thing about them. It's just that in urban areas, you might have a lot of, you might have many uh, individual insects. Uh, but it won't be a high diversity, so you won't find a lot of different types of insects. You might find a lot of, um, you know, city-adapted insects like uh, various cockroach groups, um, various types of flies that like you know, city areas, um, stuff like that. So it's certainly important to preserve wild habitats, right? It's not just in terms of preserving the numbers of, of organisms, it's the diversity that's important. Okay. And in particular regards to insects, that diversity is still 
you know, largely unknown. Uh, we still have so many to, to discover. So, thanks for watching again. And, uh, you know, see you next time on Insectamundi. Sort of end this beautiful sunset here.